Jim, thank you, Keith, Tony, all of you, uh, those that have been recognized for your past service to SAO, those of you that are currently involved. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to be here representing SAO today. And, and hey, let's face it, it's a great day to be indoors. Uh, so I'm going to actually be moving around to interact with all of you a little bit today. I hope you'll be willing to challenge me if you can't hear me at any one time. And I want to make certain that I can impact you in understanding exactly what Jim said. You have a choice of who you're going to become. And that can be the individual that has uh, sustained a stroke uh, or the individual that is a care provider. And it changes everyone's lives. And uh, for those of you here in the room, if you have not sustained a stroke or you're not a care provider, you may have a relative that has had a stroke. You may have someone in your future that has uh, yet to endure a stroke. And it's something to be appreciative of the fast signs um, and appreciative of the plight that these individuals go through uh, to rediscover themselves. Because folks, what I'm here to share with you today is uh, that neuroplasticity ensures that your brain has the ability to be able to make the changes so that we can say exactly what the title of the speech is today. It's not the end uh, when you have a stroke. And so when we understand these matters, we understand that there is an opportunity to redefine ourselves, just like Jim said. And Jim actually didn't help me write the speech um, you know, by the slides, but in providing care for Jim and many other individuals over the last 32 years of my career, Jim did help me write the speech. So let me again recognize here, uh, I know the bidding has closed already today, but uh, the envelopes on your table have not closed. We're here uh, not to hear Mike Studer, not to hear uh, about my alphabet soup, but we're here to support uh, SAO, so please do that. Let's talk briefly about what is neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity can be a long enough term that it can feel a little bit confusing. But the matter of fact, it's pretty straightforward because we understand that neuroplasticity is just as I've written up here, and for those of you that can't see it, it's really just about making connections between nerves in your brain. And it's the dynamics that allow us to be able to reach out from one neuron and connect with another neuron to share information that either translates into movement or helps you recall facts, learn a new language, uh, remember where you live, remember where you parked your car. But neuroplasticity helps us store memories better, helps us learn how to hit the golf ball better, uh, and helps us learn how to be able to tell a story to our grandchildren or to be able to walk the dog without actually tripping over the dog and remembering how to be able to keep my movement, right Jim? In the background, In the background. that's right, okay. So neuroplasticity helps our brains organize and, and it's really how we learn things, but it's how we learn things before you've had a stroke and it's there for us after we've had a stroke. So that helps us debunk one of the main myths of neuroplasticity and recovery after stroke because if this is a capacity that's been there, a dynamic learning capacity that's been there before you had a stroke, there's nothing about the event itself that keeps you from making new connections again. So we have to consider what happens, what stimulates these new connections that is the process of learning again after a stroke. So this is me in 2020, and in 2020 I would have told you this very thing in the TED Talk that says neuroplasticity after stroke is like road construction. Imagine the stroke interrupting the pathway that you normally take, the route that you normally take to access a memory. Okay, So that route is now closed because of the stroke creating a crumbling of the road, literally. Or you might even think about it as a washout. Uh, of the road depending on the type of stroke that you've had. So we make new routes and we repave the highways in our brain so that we can travel at normal speeds again and so that we can travel with multiple 
lanes of information. Imagine that we always are doing more than one thing at a time. Tony just stepped up a moment ago to make sure that I didn't trip over the cord and I've got to pay attention to what she's doing. We've always got multiple things going on. You're thinking right now, am I thirsty? Uh, do I need to readjust? I've been sitting on uh, the left side of my body too long. There's always multiple lanes of information happening in your brains at once. And neuroplasticity in 2020 could have been well described as that. So, but the brain reorganizes and our information about the dynamics of stroke recovery also evolves. And in 2020, we would have said, well, maybe a stroke is like a stop sign in the brain. And that has caused us to not be able to travel down this road at the same speed. We have to pause. We have to reprocess. But maybe it's like we can't take that route and now I've got a detour ahead sign that happened up in the brain. And maybe as a matter of fact, we get some guidance in our recovery and we have a detour sign that shows us where to be able to go get that memory, how to move my left leg again, how to turn my body to look to the left and recognize the left side of my world again. So there's a detour sign and we're guided in our recovery. And no matter what it is, we understand that neuroplasticity truly means that the brain is under construction. Okay, and that's all it means. And now you've already heard that it's learning under construction. It's the brain making new connections and there's no time frame to it. If your stroke here, we might even have a competition later on to see who had their stroke longest to go because that individual, no matter whether that was 21 or 26 years ago, your brain still has the capacity to make changes. So now let's figure out the answers to the top of the slide here. How, when, and why? So road construction after a stroke, let's understand just a little bit about neurophysiology just briefly. This is what a neuron looks like, okay? So it's got a cell body and it's got different connections. And as a matter of fact, we can get a little bit confused about this, but a neuron is actually only makes up less than half of the brain's volume. Now that might shock you a little bit, and, and it's only really the neurons that are impacted from a stroke. So now you begin to pause and think to yourself, if I've had a stroke, no matter how large it is, it's going to take a smaller portion of my brain away from me than I might have initially thought. There's more that's viable and available. So what if this neuron that I'm now representing by this blue forked diagram, what if this neuron could make anywhere from 5,000 to 100,000 connections to other neurons in the brain. One neuron can make anywhere from 5,000 to 100,000 connections in the brain. So that means if I actually continue to advance the slide here, and if I were to advance the slide representing more and more neurons populating, do you know how many times I would have to advance the slide if I did that at a rate of one per second to represent how many neurons you have in the brain? That's right, it's up here on the screen for those of you that can see that. I would have to hit that one time a second, every single second, for the next 65.7 years to be able to represent the number of neurons that you have in your brain, 86 billion neurons. Now hold on just a second, I just told you that each one of those neurons could make 5,000 to 100,000 connections. I'm not even gonna to try to do the math on how many different connections we must have in the brain when we understand 86 billion multiplied by anywhere in that range of 5,000 to 100,000. That just means there's a lot more potential left in the brain even if the stroke took a small function of that. So now I'm gonna add one more little fact on there before we step away from neuroplasticity. It only takes about 10 minutes to make a new connection. So if there's a sufficient stimulus in the brain and the brain says, I think I could do this a little bit better, or I'm gonna remember this and not forget it again, to reach out and make a new connection with a neuron that has formerly not ever been paired, it only takes about 10 minutes time, but it takes a little secret recipe to that. And we're gonna to get to that recipe because we're about ready to make an update in the definition that I provided to you only two years ago. So the update that we're going to reveal here today is that, as a matter of fact, a stroke may indicate which roads are closed, but it does not define how many alternate pathways 
you can create. More opportunities than stop signs. More routes that can be newly developed than those are currently in existence. How many of you, just by show of hands, at some point in your grade school years, you had to walk home from school and you created a new shortcut to be able to make it to your house? Anybody? Well, is there anybody left? <laughs> so you think about that. What you just did right there is you made a new connection between where you were from your grade school and where you're going to your home. You made a shortcut. So the first time you made that shortcut, if some of you were walking in a, let's say, a, a wooded field or, or an open area that had not been developed yet, you actually had to trample over some grass and some weeds, right? Maybe you didn't travel over that new pathway all that quickly your first time through there. And maybe your second time through, you had to try to remember where you started that cutoff. But then you started to go there regularly enough that you trampled down the path, established a pathway that could be recognized, that you could remember how to get to. You cleared the weeds out progressively. And now you could begin to travel faster down that pathway. And pretty soon you could run down that pathway. And guess what, folks? That's exactly what happens with neuroplasticity. I could stop my speech right now. You've learned all you need to know. <laughs> Neuroplasticity is choosing a new route, brand new information, developing that route to the point that it can sustain the speed and the massivity and the volume of information that we want to travel. And that's all it is. That's all it is. I could, I could bring many different multi-syllabic words here to explain this even more formidably. But we're going to stop with the medical terms at this point. Let's figure out exactly how to get this done. So I actually even heard it today as I walked in. One of the individuals that I've had a chance to work with is here today, actually several of them. And they were talking about, you know what he told me is if there's sufficient demand that my brain will supply it. Now let's, let's think about that. That means the brain needs a stimulus in order to actually dive into this new route. So there has to be a demand and supply. And I, I play that off of what we think about in terms of uh, a capitalist economy of supply and demand. All right, So let's just think about it in reverse. If there's a demand, then the brain can supply it. So the change required in the brain, uh, that can happen in the brain, requires a stimulus. That's the demand. And you can find that stimulus in one of three or all three of these different directions, depending on your personality, because it's really all about you. So we've got up here the consideration of independence. Hey, if I do this differently, I'll be able to be more independent in my walking, my dressing, my self-feeding, driving, my ability to drive a golf ball. I can set the ball on the tee. I want to be able to do something better by myself. So that's one reason that you may have a demand. A second reason is just so you can have an improved skill. I'm already doing this independently, but I wonder if I can do it better. Speak more fluently, swallow without coughing, walk without tripping, be able to walk my dog. I just want to be able to do it better. Take fewer strokes on the golf course, right? And then the third possibility that could be a, a reason, a demand, something compelling you would be a purpose. And that means through the improvements that I've made, I'm going to be able to affect someone else's life. Maybe that is through volunteerism, through my work, uh, and it could be actually my role or responsibilities in my family life. So now you see those are the main three reasons that you could actually find a way to be able to create that shortcut between where you are now and where you're going. So now let's debunk a couple of myths about stroke. And you can read those up there. For those of you that can see the slide, you'll understand that as I've already iterated, stroke does not have a time frame for improvement. When I graduated from physical therapy school, <laughs> we thought that people could only get as well as they had recovered within 30 days. Seriously. And then we thought, well, gosh, we've evolved. They've got upwards of 60 days. We can keep them longer in this inpatient rehabilitation center. And then we said it's three months, then it became six months, then it became a year. And many of you in this room will have heard some of those time frames. And now we actually have evidence. Take images of a brain, people that are five years post-stroke, 
put them through intensive rehabilitation, re-image their brain with the most sophisticated technology we've got now, brain has changed more than five years post-stroke. It's actually timeless. It's limitless. But, you know, you don't need me to actually talk to you about that. Many of you have experienced that. And as a matter of fact, I don't want to pretend that your lives will not have changed because of a stroke. That would be disrespectful for me to suggest that. And I don't want to suggest that you will be able to return back to the same exact individual that you had been before your stroke. But what we're talking about here today is potentially evolving into a direction that you didn't know your life could turn for the better, for the different, making a difference in someone else's life because of what you are doing now, a route that had not been taken. That's exactly what this book is about, right? I'm not going to try to sit up here and take three minutes of your time to tell you about all of the wonderful stories in this very book that you have in front of you at your table. Take it home, read those stories, and understand the evolution of individuals that have taken brand new shortcuts, repivoted their lives, and eventuated into something that they wouldn't have expected, but yet are also cherishing. So there's new possibilities ahead for all of you, but you have to decide, am I looking for more independence? Am I looking for better skill or improvement? Or am I looking for purpose? Find one of those three. Because what we're going to do is we're going to seize the brain. All right? Carpe brain is going to be really on your tongues now here until we get to the end. We want to think about seizing those opportunities. So the requirements for neuroplasticity are interesting. I'm going to go a little bit rehabilitative and I'm going to bring it right back to practical. The requirements appear to be in the science, in the medical literature, you've got to work hard. To be able to make that connection brand new in 10 minutes, it, te it needs intensity. You need success part of the time, but if you get success all of the time, your brain won't say, ah, that was thrilling when I was successful because you get too used to succeeding. It's no longer rewarding. So you need intensity, success, you need repetitions to walk that pathway again to make it established, right? You need challenge, a little bit of difficulty and error. And the science behind all that is borne out here in the middle column that says, well, what happens is we stimulate growth from one neuron to connect to another. We use reward centers. Many of you have heard about the, the, in, the chemical or neurotransmitter, neuromodulator dopamine. Hey, I'm really excited I did that. Your brain got excited and said, I want to reinforce whatever you just did do that again the next time you approach that task or that activity or that fact. So we need reward centers. We need that success. That's a chemical attraction that promotes learning. Now we understand when we take away all that science, the practicality brings it into reality. And it means, as many of you have heard from your parents, right, who probably had great work ethic, maybe you've even told this to your own children, right, good things are hard, they're difficult, they require effort. So that's where the intensity ties in. Now we're tying these in linearly. Success means I did it, I'm surprised I did it, I wanna do more of that. That's where repetitions come in. I got this, what next, all right? Give me something a little bit harder. And then finally, the challenge. And that's where measurement, measurement comes in. You'll understand that again in a few moments. All right, can I do it better next time? That compels you toward driving toward more skill as well. But you know the most important letter in neuroplasticity is you. Three letters deep into the word, the most important letter is you, and here's why. That letter gives you the permission, the opportunity, to decide, do I want more independence? Do I want more skill? Do I want more purpose? And... It, it can be spelled out in these sentences that I've provided for you. I want to learn something new. I've recovered enough right now. I need to take a break, and that's okay. There's nothing shameful about that, all right? I need to become more active. You're hearing things about wellness and steps you've taken and health metrics and wellness. Or finally, I need to feel needed, and that's where the purpose comes in. So the you decides... I want to stop working on recovery right now. I'm pleased with where I am. I'm 
glad to have evolved to whom I've become, or I want to resume again, and it doesn't really have a time frame, right? You can stop and start this as long as you follow those principles of neuroplasticity. So I can assure you this isn't the end. Literally, I'm not done talking yet. I've got some more practical information. Here's some actionables for you, all right? Here come the actionables. You've got to find yourself moving with purpose, whether it's for your own health or wellness, for the benefit of someone else that you are now a care provider for, your spouse, your grandchildren, your dog, you got to move with purpose. And I'm going to suggest to you the best route towards success and intensity is if you measure your movement. And I'm going to give you some practical ways to do that. Because if you measure your movement, your brain gets the opportunity to recognize the excitement of more success. You want to beat your measurement. That's what we call gamification. That is the stimulus for reward. You're making a game of your own movement, ability to store facts, skill, efficiency. This is the fastest I've ever gotten this shirt on. I'm ready for our appointment now. We're ready to get out the door. Just find those successful opportunities to measure movement, and you want to enjoy yourself. Enjoy neuroplasticity. Enjoy learning. Enjoy improving. Enjoy moving. And then one final compelling consideration is when you're considering if now is the right time for you to invest in more wellness, you want to think about how easy it is for you to invest in the bank of your wellness now as compared to how easy it might be for you to invest in that bank two years from now. You all know. You guys are all in this whole room are donors, right? You're nodding your heads right now, right? because you're donors here to SAO just by giving your time and your attention and spreading the word. And you may even be contributing your finances. You understand the power of compound interest. It's better for you to invest in yourselves now than to begin investing in your wellness two years from now. I'll leave you with that consideration, and that should be compelling for many of us as well. But it's time for some practical examples. So the practical example may suit you or may be related enough that it spurs you on to find a way for your own improved wellness. Here's an example. I like to walk my dog around the block. There goes the dog. Boom. So you do it. You decide you're going to walk your dog around the block and you measure your performance. You can measure the performance any way you want. You can measure it in the amount of time it takes you to walk around the block the number of times that you need to stop for a rest break is decreasing. The number of times you recognize that your left foot caught on the pavement and you scuffed your foot and you want to reduce that. There's any number of metrics just to that simple function. Find the measurement, find the activity, do it, and take some excerpt of that function. Now do it again. Step four is do it again and see if you can beat your goal. You won't beat your goal every time because I just told you seven slides ago, it's not healthy to be successful every single time. So they say, well, Mike, what if your patient is working with you and he doesn't beat his time? You just set him up for failure. Nope. I set him up for an even bigger reward when he does achieve it. We all know we can become complacent if we are consistently facing success. So you want to challenge yourself? Be willing to exceed and be willing to actually find that you're going to have to try it harder next time. So step number five is measure it again and you find out you did it in 11 minutes and 45 seconds. And then you pick something else and repeat steps two through five. And if walking your dog around the block doesn't do that for you, then see if you can find yourself in this slide where I demonstrate an individual who's doing some gardening. The repetitions of getting down and weeding or potting something into a plant at a desktop uh, or planting your garden. Find a way to engage in that. Measure yourself. Your ability to be able to drive a wheelbarrow. Your ability to lift a 20-pound sack of uh, grass seed, etc. So it could be in gardening. It could be lifting a grandchild. 
It could be adaptive kayaking. It could be power walking. And if you don't find yourselves there, look for swimming opportunities, for reading to a grandchild, for caring for a dog, or for carrying your own groceries. I was able to carry a five pound bag of groceries today with my left hand. So you're looking for something that is do it, that's compelling, that's purposeful, that can be measured, and then you go try to beat that. So the neuroplasticity checklist that I have for you spells out personable. Let's start with P. It's personalized. Remember, most important letter of neuroplasticity is you. It's something you like to do. It must be personalized. E, it's exertional, because I've already told you it requires intensity. So it's challenging, but reasonable for me to do. I don't need to be maxing out my heart rate. Repetitions, I've done it over again. I've more well trodden down the shortcut pathway that now you all are envisioning from your grade school to your home. It's repetitive because we need to form that connection solidly. It's simple. It's something that I can access. It makes sense to me. It's clearly functional and purposeful for my life. I can see how it helps me. It's objective so that we can measure it. And finally, it's nearby. It's convenient. It's ready when I am. It could be as simple as doing 10 repetitions of sit to stand from your couch. You've timed yourself, and now you're going to try to see if you can do it faster. And that's going to take you 35 seconds, one fourth of the number of commercials that are uh, right up there in interrupting your favorite show. So it's nearby, it's convenient, it's ready when I am. So road construction after a stroke, let's hit the realities now. The reality is you remember the neuron. The reality is you remember our depiction of the neuron here, right? And you understand all of those connections. 86 billion, if your stroke has actually affected, impact, impacted, and permanently removed, let's just say 150,000 neurons, you still are endowed with a significant number remaining there's more possibilities than there are damage, okay? And the connections that you can make to reroute are formidable, and you understand that now, and now you also know how to access that. So your stroke was significant. Let's be clear not to take that away. Let's also understand that your stroke did not steal, rob, or destroy your whole brain. Because again, back to the facts, something brand new for you to consider, less than half of the cells in your brain are neurons. You remember that from 21 minutes ago. But now I'll tell you that neurons only make up a quarter of your brain mass by weight. And now I'll remind you that you have 86 billion neurons. Many are viable, healthy, and ready to form new connections. So that's why it's time, folks, to get out there, make some new connections in your brain. And in the remaining time that we have here during this event, make some new connections with the people in and around in this room. And above all, I'll leave you with, again, the marker and moniker, Let's Carpe Brain. Thank you. Um, I'm actually, I'm happy to take questions. And Keith, I want to defer that to you, too. Uh, if you have other agenda we need to follow right now, I know we had talked about uh, answering questions, I can do that from the platform here, but I'm also going to be available to interact with uh, after we're all wrapped up here too. Keith, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, I, you know, I'm sorry, I think I came up a little early. Oh, it's no problem. Uh, that was incredible. I'm not kidding you. Uh, I took pages of notes. Uh, I, love, I love the part about more possibilities. So many stroke survivors, you know, they go through the stroke and then it's like, you know, excuse me, but oh hell, you know, here I am, right? And now what? And whether it's job, whether it's, you know, just dealing with your, your spouse, whatever, and you worry and you, you wonder. And so knowing the way that you laid it out is incredible to me. And I just, I'm very thankful for you. Thank you. Uh, other questions for Mike? Anybody? I'm going to take the mic. I'm going to bring the microphone to you. 
so everyone can benefit from hearing your question. Betsy, go ahead. The microphone's yours. Thank you for that great talk. Uh, can you talk about stress um, and the negative role it can play? Sure, absolutely. So Betsy, just in case you couldn't hear, she asked me to talk about stress and the negative role that it could play. And the most clear and distinct answer we have about that is stress can be a motivator. We can use it to our advantage in that measurement and gamification principles. Can I do this better? Stress can be a negative factor in that one of the main chemicals that comes from stress is cortisol. And when cortisol is released, there is a systemic impact on our bodies that uh, affects what's called our autonomic nervous system. It can cause us to feel more exerted, to feel less capable. And cortisol, a byproduct of stress, can inhibit dopamine's presence when dopamine wants to come in and say, wow, I love how you did that. Let's make new connections. And so cortisol can be the antithesis of dopamine. And that's the easiest answer for your question, Betsy, in that we want to be able to manage stress when we, as the most, indivi most important individual recovering from a stroke, remember, is you. When we are feeling like the task in front of us, functional daily task, moving, uh, how far we have to walk, to be able to manage grandchildren, packages, et cetera. When it becomes stressful, then we're not in the presence of a learning, healthy environment. We can use pressure to our advantage, but if it becomes overwhelming to the person, whatever they evaluate as too stressful, that becomes an unhealthy environment for less productive learning. Great question, thank you. Yes. Please do. What um, neuroplasticity activities or personable um, recommendations would you give for uh, aphasia? Yeah, and I'll repeat it. Yeah. Um, yeah. OK, and uh, I, I want to take the opportunity to go ahead and reiterate your question, but I don't want to cut you off. Are you done there? No, I am done. OK, so she asked another great and compelling, compelling question. What neuroplasticity activities could we recommend for persons that are enduring aphasia? Now, I'll want to make certain that I qualify myself as a physical therapist. I'm not a neuroscientist, neurologist, etc. I'm not a speech language pathologist. What we do understand from the literature is the same exact recipe as what I shared with you early in the presentation, and that is. If it's compelling to an individual to be able to speak better, I want to be more independent. Or remember the second point was, I want to do this better. I want to be more skilled. That it has to be the first point, is that the individual who's enduring aphasia has to be a motivated in one of those two functions to uh, overcome it. When we have that, we want to be able to do what's called forced use. Forced use means that we are actually requiring the brain to go through word finding, not compensating with gestures. That's one of the most recent and compelling developments in the world of aphasia, the inability to be able to communicate verbally. Okay, People can have expressive aphasia. I can't get my concept across but they can also have receptive aphasia. And I'm going to take your question as expressive aphasia. I can't find the words or form the words. So the easiest answer is in the route of saying, let's play a game. Let's play a game where you have to communicate a concept to me. Turn over the card. You'll see what the concept is that you have to communicate to me. And you are not allowed to use gestures to be able to get me to understand that concept. And so as long as we are following Betsy over here and that it's not so much pressure, I'm feeling like a failure, and it's set in a game environment, that may be my best answer for you is to use forced use. Up, oh, this is the only way you can communicate is verbally. Let's play it. 
and let's do it in a fashion that we recognize it as play, not as something that's recognized as punitive. So important for a healthy brain right there. Thank you for your question. Other questions, and maybe I should take one more to be respectful of the rest of our time. Uh, Don, I'm going to go with you back here, who traveled all the way over from Salem, and he's got a compelling question for me. And then there was somebody else over here that had a question, and I'm going to catch yours in person after we're all wrapped up, sir. Don, go ahead. Yes, sir. As you know, my, I've had two strokes, and the difficulty between, on the one side, being so active, on the other side, having to have something to help you. That's a very difficult thing for me. Could you respond to that? Yes, and you know what? That's going to ultimately tie back a little bit to Betsy too, isn't it, Don? Maybe you feel the same, is that it doesn't matter whether we express that in terms of stress or we call that stress pressure or we call it guilt or shame that other people are having to provide care for me. I've always been a very independent, active person who's seen themselves as a provider or a caregiver uh, or someone who has actually been employed and people have relied upon me. How compelling that is for me to have motivation from that to try to recover from my stroke. But you're exactly right, Don. That takes the individual's roles and responsibilities that they've had and potentially gives us the only way that we can look at it. This is not the end. We redefine our opportunities. You have had years and decades as a care provider. You've got something now that you can say, all right, I want to go back and I want to be able to pick up my grandchildren after school again, which means I've got to be able to have the motivation and capacity to learn how to drive, physically pick them up, put them into a car seat, strap them in. Maybe that's enough of a goal for you to seek your rehabilitative journey. But when you see activities that are meaningful, roles and responsibilities that you can't achieve, then we look for redefining. We say, okay, who's going to help me with that detour sign? Who's going to help me see other places that me, as a valuable individual, can seek purpose again? And that's where we go, and we let that drive our neuroplasticity uh, when that is the case then, too. Yeah. And thank you, Don, for coming all the way over from Salem with a, with a great, compelling uh, recovery then, too. I'm going to take your question when we're all wrapped up. Yes, I'm going to catch his because I think I probably better respect time right now and close up, but I will personally touch base with you first right after we're done. Okay, thank you all again.